to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in jeremiah 37 verse 17 the question was asked is there any word from the Lord? We welcome you today to our new series of lessons entitled Bible Questions and Answers. Occasionally people submit questions for us through our website or email and we wanted to answer those questions and many of these are very good questions, questions that I suspect many of us have wondered about in the past and so we hope you'll stay tuned as we're going to look to the Bible for the answer to these wonderful questions today. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. Our first question is asked in this way. Is it scriptural for a woman to pray in worship when men are present? My friend, that's a very good question. And from the outset, we want people to realize that the woman has a valuable role in the church. God has given her specific duties. God has given her specific things that she excels at that men can't do as well. But friend, let's also realize that there are boundaries and guidelines and limitations as it relates to public prayer where both men and women are present. I remember recently someone telling me that they had gone to a denominational uh, service and during the service uh, while there were men present a woman just got up and began to pray and it made them feel uncomfortable and they didn't know exactly how the scripture felt about that. Well how does God define this in prayer? Is it scriptural when men and women are gathered together for a woman to stand up and lead prayer? Friend the answer is no from the scripture. Now listen to the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. The Apostle Paul says these words, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. In the worship assembly, when we are gathered together, a woman is to be silent, she is to learn in submission, and she is not to take a leadership role in which she has authority over a man. Being in the place where one stands up and leads prayer publicly would be a leadership and authority position, and thus women are not authorized to do that in the presence of men. In fact, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8, the Apostle Paul will say, 
I desire therefore that men, and that's the Greek word for males, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere. God has designated that as part of the leadership responsibility given to men in the church. That doesn't mean a woman can't say a prayer, a good prayer even, in front of other women. Doesn't mean that she doesn't know how to pray or isn't important, but this is the, the guideline and the setting which God has put forth for prayer in the public worship assembly. Now, another passage that also addresses the role of women in the worship assembly is found in 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 34. The Apostle Paul says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive as the law also says. And so what about a, a woman preaching or a woman standing up to lead prayer in a mixed assembly or something like unto that? Well, friend, the Bible says they're to remain silent. The Bible says they're to be submissive. The Bible says that men are to pray everywhere. And again, we're not saying women aren't important. Thank God for every faithful a woman in the Lord's church who fulfills her role, who does her part to help the church, who is faithful in serving God in every way that is outlined. But friend, we want to be clear that the Bible does not say that women should take a leadership role in preaching or praying and things like that that God has specifically addressed for men. And so this will be one of the identifying characteristics of the role of men versus the role of women and are we going to go by what the Bible says and do these things? Now I know as well as you do that there are a lot of denominational organizations where women will stand up and preach or women will stand up and lead a mixed assembly in prayer. But friend, if we're going to go by what the Bible says, if we're going to take God at His word and follow His teaching, we need to realize there is a designated and specific role given to men and there is a designated and specific role given to women and each have unique responsibilities inside the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is not acceptable according to the scripture for a woman to preach or a woman to lead prayer in a mixed assembly that would be a clear violation of these passages. All right, let's then turn our attention to our second question that's been submitted. The question is asked in this way. I recently heard someone say or teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Does the scripture teach that Mary remained a virgin all her life? Now this is one of the predominant doctrines of Catholicism and Catholicism will teach its adherents from a very young age that Mary was a, a, a virgin and that she was a perpetual virgin all of her life, that she remained a virgin until death. Well friend, what exactly does the Bible say on this idea? There are three passages which clearly and explicitly refute the idea of Mary remaining a perpetual virgin forever. That's just not taught. In fact, it is clearly taught that she was not a virgin all of her life in Scripture. What passages are they? Would you look in your Bible with me in Matthew, the first chapter? Matthew chapter 1, we learn clearly that Mary was not to remain a virgin all of her life. In fact, we see that from the language of Matthew 1 verse 24 and 25. Notice these words with me. The Bible says, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him his wife, and did not know her till... She had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Here it is clearly implied that while Christ was in the womb, while she was pregnant with Christ, uh, Joseph did not know her until, there's the adverb of time, indicating there was a point in time when she was no longer remaining in that virgin state. And so he did not know her until 
she brought forth a son. Now, we learn from this that they did have relations together, that she did not always remain a virgin, and that the natural relationship between Joseph and Mary is something that is sanctioned by Scripture. Do you remember Hebrews 13, 4? Marriage is honorable among all, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Just like any other married couple, Joseph and Mary had the right to participate in the relations God has designed between a man and a woman, and there's nothing in the Scripture that indicates that she remained a perpetual virgin all of her life. In fact, the next two passages we're going to look at clearly teach that Mary had other sons and daughters besides Jesus. Now, I want to direct your attention to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and I want you to notice these words with me as we think about this question in Matthew 13. Look beginning in verse number 53. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these parables, that He departed from there. When he came to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? Now watch this. And his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Now here we learn that Jesus had both brothers and sisters. And it goes on to mention those. Uh, Simon, Joseph, Judas, uh, others. He had a family. And thus if Jesus had, listen carefully now. If Jesus had brothers and sisters, then friend that requires that Mary was not a perpetual virgin. It goes on to say that he had brothers and sisters, and it actually names Jesus' brothers in this context. Now, I know the argument is this. Some will say, well, that's just using the term brother as we might use it in a spiritual sense, talking about more of a spiritual family than a physical family. Well, friend, that cannot be the case when you read Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3, we learn that Jesus' family who was calling to Him was His physical family, and Jesus clearly contrasted that with His spiritual family. Look in your Bible in Mark chapter 3, and I want you to see what they say to Jesus and His response about His physical family calling to Him. Mark chapter 3, listen to verse number 31. The Bible says, Then his, that is Jesus, then Jesus' brothers and his mother came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Watch this now, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now this is a clear contrast between physical family and spiritual family. Jesus' physical family, his mother and his brothers, they came looking for him and they began to call to him. And the people said, Hey, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus looked around and he said, Wait a minute. These people right here spiritually, you're my mother, my brother, or my sister. He clearly contrasted spiritual family from his mother and his brothers, physical family that was calling to him. And so what does the evidence of Scripture teach us? Friend, when you combine Matthew 1, verse 24 and 25, that Joseph did not know Mary until... Jesus was born with Matthew 13 and Mark chapter 3. It's clear. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Where did those ideas come from? They came from the doctrines and teachings of men, not from Scripture. But friend, I hope you'll listen real carefully to this. This is a major doctrine of Catholicism that we have just seen from the Scripture is not true. If Catholics are teaching error on that, what else are they teaching error on? And friend, that's something you want to examine carefully, that you want to make sure that a person follows the Bible on these teachings and not the word and the will of men. 
All right, a third question. And as we present this series of lessons, we want to remind you that if you'd we want to let you know that if you'd like to submit a question, you can do that through our website. Just visit us at thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and you can fill out a form and send us questions or you can email them at this address, questions at thegospelofchrist.com. And so if you've got a Bible question you'd like for us to address, we'll try to do that. Just send those in to us through our website or the email address given, and we can surely do our best to answer those from the Scripture as well. Third question for our consideration today is this. Someone writes in and asks, Is sprinkling an acceptable mode of baptism. And by this, when we think about that baptism, if you'll look in a Webster's Dictionary today under the word baptism, it might say uh, immersion, sprinkling, or pouring. And so kind of a dictionary def definition sets up the idea that could be any one of those three. But friend, what about a Bible definition? Is sprinkling an acceptable mode of baptism found in the Scripture? Friend, you don't find, when, when talking about the mode of baptism, you don't find sprinkling as an acceptable mode. And so, no, it is not an acceptable mode, and here's the reason why. In the Greek language, there are two different words for sprinkling and baptism. The word rantidzo is the word for sprinkling, and it is used in the New Testament for the sprinkling of blood and other items like unto that. And so, God had a word for sprinkling in the Greek language, rantidzo, and that's not the word he used. He used the word baptizo, which if one studies the Greek language, it is used of submerging, immersing, or plunging in the water. And so the, the words themselves are unique, and the Bible uses the word for immersion or plunging. But then we can also know from Scripture Several examples we, sh we see clearly show us that the mode of baptism is only in the Bible used as immersion. Now, let me mention those passages to you. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it is said at the baptism of Jesus, and coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. How, you know, a lot of people are asking the good question what would Jesus do? Well, friend, what would Jesus do? concerning the mode of baptism. Listen now, coming up out of the water. That doesn't sound like sprinkling, and that doesn't sound like pouring. To come up out of water, you first have to go down into it. In fact, the little Greek word there is the word ek, meaning out from within, is the idea. And so Jesus came up out of the water. That's a clear picture of immersion. Here are three other passages that also teach us about the mode of baptism. John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in the region of Anon near Salim. The Bible says because there was much water there. Much water? How much water does it take to sprinkle? Not much. Handful, spoonful, a little bit. How much water does it take to pour a little on somebody? A glass, maybe? How much water does it take to immerse, get a full-grown adult all the way under the water? Much water. And then two other passages, Acts chapter 8, about verses 36 through 40, we have the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip has been teaching him about baptism. Here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. He stopped the chariot. Both Philip and the eunuch got down out of the chariot. They went down into the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Now, why did they have to both get out of the chariot? One of them could have went and got some water, if sprinkling or pouring, okay. Why did they have to both get in the water? Why did they both come up? There's the idea again that you find from the examples in the New Testament that baptism is immersion. But the fourth example is really one of the clearest pictures. Romans chapter 6 Verses 1 through 4, baptism is likened unto a burial. Paul said we're buried with Christ in baptism. Now, Paul would not use an illustration, or the Holy Spirit would not use an illustration that contradicts the mode of baptism. Think about baptism in the terms of a burial. When a body is buried, what happens? It's completely encased in something. For example, our culture today, you dig a hole in the ground, there's dirt on the bottom, dirt on every side, and then they lay the body on top and sprinkle a little dirt on it, right? 
No, poor little dirt. No. They put that body in the grave and they completely immerse it, cover it in the ground. A burial, by its very definition, is an immersing, an encasing in something. And thus, when we think about baptism in the New Testament, it clearly is immersion. Now, I understand a lot of people have uh, trouble with that idea as it relates to babies and as it relates to original sin. We've got questions in the future that we're going to answer about that. But friend, we do not find in the Bible sprinkling as a mode of baptism in any of the examples that we see. Let's then turn our attention to a fourth question that has been submitted. Someone writes, I once heard someone say that to be saved we need to say the sinner's prayer. I've been looking into that idea some. Where is the sinner's prayer found at in the Bible? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, I've heard it mentioned a lot myself, so much so that you would think it's got to be in the Bible somewhere. The prayer will usually go something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Lord and Savior. I ask you now to come into my heart and my life and save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, where is that or some variation of it found in the Bible? We hear preachers all the time who will say, to be saved, just say the sinner's prayer, and they'll repeat those words. Where's that at in Scripture? Where, did he, where was anybody told to say a sinner's prayer? Where is that model for the sinner's prayer found at in Scripture? And friend, here's what's astounding. You can read your Bible from the very first verse of Genesis 1 to the very last verse of Revelation 22. And you won't find the sinner's prayer mentioned one time. What? Isn't that amazing? People are going around telling others to be saved. You need to say the sinner's prayer. Here's an example of that sinner's prayer. Here's what you need to do. Millions of people have bought into that idea and now think they're saved. And you don't ever find that even one time in the Bible? Well, that's exactly right. You don't even find it one time in the Scripture. I had preached a meeting one time in a congregation where I had mentioned as talking about the plan of salvation that you can read your Bible from Genesis 1-1 all the way through to Revelation chapter 22 and you will not find the sinner's prayer as men are told to pray today. And so afterward a lady came up to me and she said, she said, Preacher, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer. Kind of troubles me a little bit. She said, I'm going to go home and ask my pastor uh, if that's in the Bible. I said, well, I hope you do. And whatever Bible verses he gives you, I want you to bring those back and show me. And so we started the meeting up the second night and she came up to me as the meeting, before the meeting began, and she said, Preacher, she said, I went home and I asked my pastor about the sinner's prayer being in the Bible, if it was in the Bible, and he said you was right. And I told him he was a liar. My friend, I want you to think about that. That man had told a multitude of people probably, maybe even that lady herself, that to be saved, she probably need to come forward, have some kind of altar call, kneel down, say the sinner's prayer, receive Jesus in your heart, and you'll be saved. And when she questioned him about that, he said, well, it's just not in the Bible. There isn't one. Isn't that amazing? Where's the sinner's prayer found out in the Bible? It's just not there. Well, friend, what does the Bible teach on the subject of salvation? If people are not taught to pray the sinner's prayer in the Bible, what are they taught to do to be saved? Well, as we look to the Scripture, we find questions about salvation being asked. Acts chapter 2 Verse number 37, on the day of Pentecost, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do now that we realize we've killed our own Messiah and we want to be forgiven? Uh, Acts 16, verse 30 and 31, the jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And friend, there is a clarion answer in every example that we find of what mon one must do to be saved, and it's not the sinner's prayer. You first have to hear the word of Almighty God. For Peter to preach about, for those people to hear about salvation in Jesus, they had to hear the message of Christ first. And the Bible clearly teaches, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. 
once a person has heard the message, looked at the message, examined the evidence, checked it from the Scripture to see if it's true, once he determines that it is, he must believe Jesus is the Savior of the world. Without believing in Jesus, there'll be no salvation. Jesus said in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Then a person must be willing to repent. That is, you've got to turn from a life of sin and selfishness to God's way of thinking. It's a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. In Luke chapter 13, verse number 3, Jesus said in verse 3 and in verse 5, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Peter preached in Acts 3 verse 19, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Once then a person has repented, he must confess Jesus as the Savior of the world. Romans 10 verse 10 says, For with the heart, the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, men and women must say, I believe Jesus is the Christ the Son of the living God, Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And then, friend, the Bible does teach, and we hope you'll listen real carefully. The Bible does teach that to be saved, you must be baptized. 1 Peter 3, 21 says those exact words. Baptism, listen, this is what the Bible says now. Baptism does now also save us. Now, is that hard to understand? Baptism does now also save us? If the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.21, baptism does now also save us, why would we dare say anything different? Jesus said in Mark 16.16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so we're so glad that you've joined us today for our first lesson in our series on Bible questions and answers. Again, if you'd like to submit a question, please email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit us on the web, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and submit those questions and we'll do our best to give a Bible answer for every question that is asked. And friend, more than anything, each of us need to have the zeal and the desire it, that if God says it, no matter how hard or how difficult, our life is going to line up with the will of God so that ultimately we can go to heaven one day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.